We're here with NYU colleague Clay Shirky, a professor at the Tisch School and a recently appointed Vice Provost of Educational Technology. Did I get that right? That's exactly right. And has recently returned from three years in China. So let's start there. China has this reputation for more for less. Uh, unbelievable skills right, right. around supply chain and figuring out a way to get us um, something for less than we're used to, used to paying for it. But you talk a lot about what makes or the China form of innovation. Yeah, so I, I, when I started going over to help NYU set up a Shanghai campus, I, yep. I bought a phone while I was there. I needed a Chinese phone. I just saw one I liked. I bought it. When I got to the campus, uh, we only had freshmen at the time, so there's all these 18-year-olds running around. I pull this phone out of my pocket, and they go, where did you get that? Mm -hmm. And I'm not used to being the envy of teenagers. Let me tell you, it does not happen. Not a familiar feeling before or since. But for the moment I had this phone, I was like, well, what is this thing? And like, that phone is sold out in all of China. It was the Xiaomi Mi 3. Xiaomi was kind of the apple of China, as it was often called. And About three years ago, two, three years ago? Yeah, exactly right, yeah, yeah, 20, yeah. 2013. And, yeah. and, and Le Jun, who is the charismatic CEO, uh, was often compared to Steve Jobs. But Xiaomi's innovation wasn't so much hardware focused the way Apple's was. It was building this software ecosystem. They rewrote the operating system. They're using an Android operating system, but they rewrote it to be especially tolerant of low battery, uh, you know, low battery draining, dual SIM for people who are swapping SIM networks for cost conscious consumers and so forth. So they took all of the sort of Shanzai tradition, the very rapid creation of electronics in this relatively open way, and they used it to drive the hardware cost down. But they also innovated on sales and marketing and delivery. They only sold online. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have these flash sales where you had to apply for a ticket to have a chance to buy a phone. What that let them do was it let them aggregate demand at larger scale than they could deliver. Then they'd go down to Shenzhen and say, we know we have a million customers for this phone. Give us the million unit price for these parts. And so the whole thing was this, eco the innovation was in the ecosystem in a way. What Xiaomi was doing was saying, if you want a phone that is not just cheap, as China has always been best in the world at, but surprisingly much better quality for the cost you're paying. If we want to use design to inflect the cost curve up, it's not enough to design the phone. You have to design the sales, you have to design the marketing. Um, they insourced customer service. Usually that's a, that's a, a function people want to get rid of. Mm -hmm. They said, no, no, if someone is talking to a customer about our product and that customer is not happy, we want to know it first. And so in Beijing, right, in the, in the Zhang Guanzhou neighborhood, in the kind of, you know, Silicon Valley of China, as it were, uh, there are people answering the phone, talking to them about Xiaomi, operating on chat, because they just rethought all of the things you could do as an electronics company to, to control costs downwards, as always, while raising quality. You talk a lot about sales and delivery innovation in China. Speak more about yeah, that. Yeah. So, so there, there are many things that are different about, about China, particularly if you're living in a large city. Um, the combination of urban density and a large educated workforce, um, but low wages, means that you can get these incredibly effective networks, right? The, the ability to have almost anything delivered within a two-hour window is really extraordinary, right? You, you buy something, and a couple of hours later, a guy on a motorbike drives up, you sign for it, and, and off he goes. Um, they've moved to an, a, an almost completely cashless economy. Uh, my wife and I went to a new restaurant that had opened up in our neighborhood. Uh, we sat down. They, they we couldn't figure out even how to order. And there was no menu. We asked for a menu. And the woman just pointed to the QR code on the table. You take a picture of the QR code, those little two-dimensional barcodes. The menu pops up on your phone. You select what you want. You press the button. The order's on the way. Um, so the entire, the entire front end of the restaurant is automated. Then it turns out the back end is automated, too. We said, well, okay, we're ready for the check now. She's like, pay on your phone. And we're like, oh, we don't have WeChat set up for payment yet. It's hard as a foreigner to get mm -hmm. into some of the payment systems. She took pity on us. She took our money, put it in her own pocket, and used her WeChat account. There was not a cash register in the restaurant. They couldn't even take money if they wanted to. 
And that's, in a way, I think why the sales and delivery stuff is so important, is it, is it doesn't just speed up the way businesses used to do things. It invites businesses to say, if these systems exist and I can take them for granted, what else can I reconsider? So now you've got a restaurant with no menus, no waiters, and no, no cash register. What you've got are cooks and runners. And it is a different way to run a restaurant. And because everyone walks in with the phone, you can offload a lot of the electronics and networking to the, to the devices the customers have already capitalized and are sitting in their own pocket. So just for, let's talk, talk a little bit about payments. Let's stop there. So yeah, payments yeah. make a ton of sense. They were supposed to take off here. Apple Pay got a ton of sign up from a, a retail standpoint, but it just hasn't got a lot of consumer right. adoption. And some of the, right. there's some niche players, Venmo, PayPal, I don't know if you call that a niche player. Yeah. But what is it about our society and our, our culture where we don't adopt payment in some of these automated digital platforms as quickly yeah. as China does. So there's, there's two different things going on. One, China is very comfortable with monopoly, right? Because the state is willing to intervene in businesses, they are very comfortable saying one or a small number of companies will control a very large part of the economy because they are, the, the government itself is a more active constraint on what those companies are able to do. The government is also willing to knock heads together in the direction of interoperability. Um, if the U.S. government said you can have any payment system you want as long as it looks like this on the back end, then Apple Pay and Samsung Pay and Venmo and all of these various systems would be much more interoperable than they currently are. Um, the other is they don't have investment in the previous system. They're doing what's called technological leapfrogging. Um, in the way that there are countries in Africa that have had extraordinarily rapid mobile phone growth. Skip landlines. Skip, skip landlines yeah. completely. There's no copper in the ground to worry about. Um, in the case of China, they really went from super cheap Nokia style, all it does is voice and text, straight to smartphones. And the massive adoption coupled with the low cost, which, which you know, drives, that, uh, drives those network effects really everywhere in the country means that it is a very, there's a very short window to be one of those early successful companies that's getting, getting drawn up. And you're not competing with, well, we already had a perfectly functional, you know, electronic billing system or electronic checking system before. There isn't a lot of credit cards. There aren't a lot of credit cards. People use debit cards. Um, the electronic systems that were set up around those appeared all of a sudden, they were useful for e-commerce, their time e-commerce was growing, and there was no old system to kind of overcome. And the US credit cards have worked well enough for long enough that they're really deeply embedded. And the value of replacing credit cards with, with you know, take a picture of a QR code on your phone, it's just, it's a, it's a smaller step, and the sunk cost of the previous systems are larger. So yeah, it is, it is very weird to come back to New York City and think it feels so primitive. Like just paying for things here feels really primitive compared to China where I just stopped carrying cash. As long as I had my phone in my pocket, I could, I could interact. And it, by the time we were leaving, it was just, just last July, uh, street vendors who were making, you know, joutsa and pancakes and they're making sort of street food would have a little QR code, mm -hmm. right? You buy six dumplings, take a picture of the QR code, transaction's done. So Xiaomi, most valuable startup at one, in history at one point right. or to date, kind of, it feels like it's sort of disappeared or it's gone AWOL. Was it local competitors? Was it, app, was it Apple coming in and taking back the high? I mean, what happened there? Yeah, so the Xiaomi story is, is interesting because it was the, I mean, at the end of 2014, it was the most valuable startup in history, $45 billion. I took a billion and change on an imputed valuation of $45 billion. And Uber at the time was only worth 40. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was this moment of, oh my God, this is it. This is when China is breaking out into the world economy. Um, several things could have gone wrong. All of them happened. So the biggest one is exactly what you said, local competition. Um, there were a collection of low-cost phone providers operating mostly out of Shenzhen, the electronics district just north of Hong Kong. Um, Huawei, uh, Oppo, and Vivo principally are the, are the three brands. And Americans are starting to know Huawei because those phones are starting to show up here. 
they copied Xiaomi so quickly. They saw that what Xiaomi was doing was, was keeping price low but creating a better margin. And that turned out to be relatively readily copyable in that ecosystem. Partly because China's not a strong enforcer of IP law, but partly because Xiaomi based their operating system on the open source Android platform, so the copying was easier. Um, the next thing is Xiaomi's imputed valuation came from the idea that every product a person buys is going to have the economics of a cell phone, right? You buy a toaster, you buy a rice cooker, you buy a watch, you buy a drone, whatever. They were making all of these uh, products. They were becoming a kind of general industrial design firm. And there is that Internet of Things idea floating around that somehow you want your scale to talk to the elevator. But I don't know what they would say to each other. I don't have anything coherent that my toaster needs to say to my, you know, my electric blanket. And that idea turned out not to work well, right? That people weren't, in fact, buying Xiaomi products with the idea that they would have an all Xiaomi home that was networked and, and tightly controlled by them on their, on their Xiaomi phone. So those revenues didn't show up. Uh, Xiaomi bet on services revenues for things like uh, cash exchanges. That, in fact, went to the platform that had the widest adoption, which was first Alipay and now WeChat. Um, so it turned out a pure software play worked better for that. And then when they opened up in India, uh, they got sued and they had to shut down sales within four days of arriving because uh, Qualcomm sued them over a, over a patent issue. So really on every front, local competition uh, lack of Internet of Things style network effects, lack of services revenues, and headwind for international expansion, they all hit at the same time. Perfect storm. It was a perfect storm. And Xiaomi is still there. They're still making phones. The phones are great, but they are now out of the top five. The Chinese manufacturers are uh, uh, principally uh, Huawei, Oppo, Vivo. Um, so Xiaomi is still a multi-billion dollar company that operates you know, in the largest market in the world but they are far from the heights they were at at the end of 2014. So you teach kids, we both teach kids, kids come to my office hours, as I'm sure they do to yours, and they want to talk about career mm -hmm. options and where should I go to work. Yep. So a kid gets, a uh, kid uh, born in China, speaks perfect Mandarin, educated in the U.S., speaks perfect English, and has an offer from Amazon or an offer from Alibaba, one in New York, one in Shanghai. If they're just an economic animal, not quality of life or anything like that, yeah, yeah. where would you suggest they go to work? Let me put it this way. If you care most about the global market, you go to work for Amazon, you go to work for Google, you go to work for Facebook. Um, if you care most about rapid growth, you go to China. So gone for three years, you come back, you don't see the gradual changes, you get kind of come back and see how things have changed in three right. years. What surprises you most about social media and the big four and big tech that's happened in the last three years while you've been gone? Not even so much what was going on with those companies, um, except for Amazon, most development has seemed to me to be incremental. Amazon is the only one consistently doing really surprising things. What's surprising is the change in attitude. Ben Smith recently wrote about this beautifully, saying the era in which big tech got the benefit of the doubt is over, and they're heading into a world of normal politics and normal regulation. People have simply decided that what's happening in Silicon Valley is not magic. It's just the market. And that there are issues and constraints that will come up largely around antitrust, monopolistic practices, obviously workplace practices. And that, that change in attitude happened while I was in China. Um, at the same time, what has surprised me that was true when I left and is still true now, but, but China inflected it, China is incredibly optimistic. It is. I mean, it has its problems. What country doesn't? But I was dealing all the time with both my, my Chinese colleagues, but also about half my students are, are, are Chinese citizens, with the sense that they're in a country that can do anything. Mm -hmm. And I remember that growing up. America felt like that in, in, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, and it went away, uh, obviously, largely because of the financial crisis, and, which then got people talking about other, other problems the U.S. had. But the contrast was incredibly striking. The U.S. is, it seems to me that there's this sense that nothing can get better. And in China, you, if, literally, if you just sit there, 
and time passes, things get better. You get back to New York. LaGuardia. My yeah. God, right, no, yeah. I, I left from PVG, I left from the Shanghai International Airport, I landed in JFK, it's like, okay, one of these airports is in a developing country and one of these airports is in a developed country. But I'd swear they were yeah. swapped. No, you expect to see chickens running around JFK. <laughs> the, the, but, but having said that, so China's more optimistic. We look at China, how, how can they build you know, these kind of Skidmore, Owens-designed airports that are just incredible. Uh, but what, the observation I would have, and again, I'm sounding like the ugly American here, is that all the Chinese students I have in my class mm -hmm. are desperately trying to figure out ways to stay. Uh, in America, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't see that same. Yeah. Still, when given a choice, I find that the mo majority of young people with options would rather be here. Yeah, now that that is true. There is a sense, um, and it may be slightly muted among my population because many of them have come to me. They're interested in social media, and China is clearly where the action is. In a way, mm -hmm. it's e it would be easier to say, "I want to go work for Tencent," which is the parent company of WeChat. Um, then I'm going to stay in the U.S. and take my chances in the internet in the internet industry here. Um, but there is a way in which, if you want to do global business, or if you want to be, if you want really, if you want to be part of any global community, you'd be better off here. But that's true uh, in comparison with almost any country in the world. But I also know people who want to study here but go back sometimes because they see the opportunity in China, but sometimes because they want to change China. Um, there's a kind of patriotism among young people that isn't my country right or wrong, it's- My country. My country, yeah. China can do anything, so why don't we fix these problems? And the tension between people saying, well, let's just get rid of the pollution, and Beijing saying, no, no, those, like the people running the polluting industries are also government officials, so it's not so easy to shut it down. Like, as this cohort ages, that tension is going to become part of how they figure out how to govern. Um, but anywhere in the world, the people making the most cosmopolitan choices are going to come mm -hmm. here. There's no, as the U.S. withdraws from the world somewhat under Trump, there's no obvious replacement. It's not like we're shrinking back and some other cosmopolitan center is coming forward. It's like we're shrinking back and maybe the global interconnectedness is just going to come under pressure. But certainly anyone, and, and I think anyone who'd find their way either to Stern or to you is going to be minded to be thinking on a global canvas. I can bet that most of those students want to, want to work elsewhere. So a book, articles, website, where can people find more, more information from Clay? Uh, Sugar.com, of course. Uh, but uh, the the... Most recent book is, is Little Rice, which is published by Columbia, uh, the Global Columbia Global Report series. Um, and then Here Comes Everybody and Cognitive Surplus, my two books about social media, will remain, remain on the bookshelves. Good. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. You are my best friend and we've got some shit to shoot. Yo, you want to meet me at the bar? Yeah. Yo, you want to meet me at the lounge? Yeah. Yo, you want to meet me in the club? Yeah. Yo, you want to meet me downtown?